Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to City Hall. Who's excited? Oh, come on. Who's excited? Okay, it's going to be a great uh, morning. I'm going to speak for a little while and bring on our uh, two uh, guests. And the reason why you're here today is this year we are we have a big campaign called Behind Every Great City. Behind Every Great City is equality, is opportunity, and is progress. And we're really keen to make sure this year we take advantage of it being 100 years since the first women got the right to uh, vote. And I've got with me on stage now, and you're going to probably raise the roof and make me have to bring in the builders when I ask them to come on stage, but two of the uh, leading feminists in the world. And they're in positions of power and influence, and they are amazing people. Uh, they're going to take a couple of minutes to kick things off, and they're going to take questions from you. So I want you to raise the roof. Why don't I introduce, uh, uh, firstly, the Prime Minister for Canada, and then secondly, the Prime Minister for New Zealand. So are you ready? Yes. Now, are you excited? Yes. So let's give a big, warm London welcome to the Prime Minister from Canada, Justin Trudeau. <laughs> And we can do better. The Prime Minister from New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. <laughs> so Justin and uh, Jacinda have very kindly agreed to take as many questions as we can fit in to their busy schedule. This is the first public event either of them are doing because they were keen to listen to young Londoners and take uh, your questions. Next week in Parliament Square, we're going to unveil the first ever statue of a woman. Mm. Who's going to come along? Yeah. <laughs> so look, so, so what, what, what we're going to do is, uh, I'll speak to your teachers, by the way, for those students, and you can come along as well. Yeah. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take questions from uh, you. Before we take the questions, I've got a list of those of you who uh, wanted to ask a question. I've got your names down here. Um, can I just check? We've got Heartlands High here. <laughs> oh, that wasn't loud yeah, enough. I don't think they're here. They're, they're well, okay then. Here. Are Deptford Green here? Yeah! yeah they, they might be here. St. Saibis and St. Olives? Yeah! Oh, they're definitely, definitely here. So, look, here. so I'm going to ask the Prime Minister of, uh, of Canada, Justin, to say a few words. Uh, and then we're going to ask uh, uh, Jacinda, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, to say a few words. And then we're going to open it up. Is that okay? Justin, over to you. Uh, this, one of the uh, great things about this job is an opportunity uh, to sit down and meet with a huge range of people, different backgrounds. My favorite thing to do uh, is to meet with young people because the way you're asking questions about everything, the way you're challenging us, uh, society, to think differently, to evolve, to change, to be challenged, is super important in politics but in just about every area. Uh, as we're going through a time of tremendous change, getting young people to realize that you are not unlike what people tell you, the leaders of tomorrow. You're already leaders today. And what you do today and the actions you take right now have a deep, deep impact. And uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about today, which is so important, is we all have important voices to raise, every single one of us. And on the issue of feminism, obviously that means uh, making sure that girls are speaking loud and proud but it also means that men have to be part of the solution. Guys need to speak up. Be proud of saying that, yes, we are feminists, because we know uh, that men and women uh, need to be equal, and there's a lot of work to do. It's, that's, uh, that's what we have to do together, and that's uh, why I'm so glad to uh, be here to hear your questions. Now, before I introduce Jacinda, can I just say this? There are many claims to fame she has, uh, but the biggest thing that I'm most proud of is uh, she spent two and a half years living in London. So we have a Londoner who's the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. Thank you, um, Sadiq. I got nervous when you said biggest claim to fame because <laughs> I immediately think about my front bag um, when anyone makes a reference like that. It's really wonderful. Um, to be uh, here with you today, and I really want to leave mostly, I want to leave time for questions. So I want to hear from you what you're interested uh, in hearing from us about. But one thing I did want to say was congratulations on celebrating 100 years of women's suffrage. 
Um, in New Zealand, we're celebrating 125 years of Show women's off. suffrage. And, <laughs> and, and I was about to say, is despite being really proud of that, I think we always have to be careful that we're not complacent. You know, even having a, a female prime minister does not mean that you have achieved equality. As long as we have a gender pay gap, as long as we have women who are, are overrepresented in low paid work, uh, as long as we have women who are more likely to experience domestic violence, then there is a lot of work to do. And so for me, the issue of equality, it spans across so many areas. And so I'm so pleased to know that there is no complacency here because we do need to make sure that we just keep working to make things better and better so that in the future, uh, your children, my children, these things won't be child. If I say children plural, Clark gets very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that things will be better for that next generation than they ever are now. So thank you for being so interested in this really important topic. So, so, so look, both Justin and Jacinda didn't did want to make long speeches uh, and they've got no idea what questions you're going to ask. Uh, so. Fingers crossed this works. Uh, so we, I've got, I've got the, fir the first three names I've got down here, just the names, I've not got the questions. So the first round, we're going to do Nabila first from Heartlands High, then Dixie Lee from Deptford Green, and then Tai Ho from St. Saviour's. So Nabila first, where's Nabila? If you give one, let, let, let the mic come over to you. I think Nabila's teacher's there, about to give her a clap before she asks the question. But for, for Nabila, for, first question. Uh, who are your female role models? Great, first question. Dixie Lee, where's Dixie Lee? Okay, just wait for the mic behind you. Turn around. Um, what advice would you give to a girl like me looking to become Prime Minister? And Alicia, I'm glad you said Prime Minister, not Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> tai Ho. Just pass it back to Tai Ho, yeah. Um, hi, my question is about the gender stereotyping as we grow up. And people say that men can only do certain things and women can only do certain things. And how can we make sure that girls and boys get the same opportunities? Just do you want to kick things off, and then we'll come to Justin afterwards? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and I'll try and cover all of those at once. Um, my answer to my role model is really cheesy, but it's true. Um, my my mother is a huge role model to me, uh, and I think probably we always draw inspiration from the people who are closest to us. Um, but the thing uh, that really um, has guided me through my life are the values that I have and the principles that are really important to me and I learnt them from my parents. Particularly, I learnt kindness and generosity from my mother. You know, my mother was always, you know, she, when I was growing up, she ran my school cafeteria, which was really handy uh, come lunchtime. Um, but it meant she made a lot of sacrifices to make sure she was around for me and my sister. But the principles and values she taught me about looking out for one another, she always the kind of person who would be the first to take a lasagna to someone who needed one, she taught me probably the principle that guides me in the leadership role I have every single day. So yes, we all have our heroes, people we may not ever meet, but the ones in our everyday lives you can le learn really important lessons from too. Advice for someone who wants to be a Prime Minister? Great uh, question. Um, you know, I've got a very, very quick question for all of you. Who's got a dream job in mind? Dream job. Something that you absolutely believe that would be the best thing in the world to do if you could do it. Dream job. Okay. Is it the same thing as what you think you're going to do? Now, when I do this back home, I'm always surprised at the number of hands that come down. That the thing that you would love to do most in the world might not be the thing that you actually think you're going to end up doing. So my advice to anyone who wants to be a Prime Minister, never give up on believing that you can do it. Um, because the biggest barrier, I think, to particularly for women, speaking in a general assumption, but I think the biggest barrier for us achieving some of our goals is our own belief that we can't. Plenty of people are going to put barriers up for you. You don't need to be one of them. So just keep that self-belief because uh, there are a lot of people out there that you'd admire a lot who probably have struggled with confidence themselves, and I'd say that I was one of them. Can I just ask you, when did you decide you wanted to be Prime Minister? I didn't. <laughs> Is it for the reasons you've said? Oh, I just, I I've never saw myself being able to, to take on such a role. And I've always been really open about that. It's just something that I thought was, uh, was just something others um, did. I, I absolutely believed I could do it, just never saw myself doing the role. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Justin. 
Um, I, I'm going to start with uh, the last question, the way we raise our kids on gender stereotyping, how we show you guys that you can do anything. And, and for me, I spent a lot of years as a youth advocate, and as I got older and older and still tried to talk about youth, I'd project myself back. Uh, but now I'm a dad, and when I think about youth, I look at my kids and I project them forward. And one of the things that I've realized and I've talked about a lot is um, making sure that I raise my daughter to understand that she can do absolutely anything, that there should be no barriers, uh, that she should have all the opportunities in the world. But uh, my wife, who, Sophie, who's actually one of my role models and inspirations as a woman, a woman there's no question about it, um, pointed out to me that it's great that you're raising your daughter uh, to be uh, a feminist and to think about gender equality and know that she can do anything, but you got to raise your sons as well to be feminists and to support uh, their sister and you know, girls around the world uh, to be able to know that they do any, uh, can do everything. And how we change mindsets, uh, not just among women but around men, and include men in the conversation on women's equality. If you think about it, we're in a situation where men are unfairly given more opportunities, more power, more weight to what they say and do because we have an imbalance in our society. Well, the men have to be encouraged and brought along to use that extra power and weight we give them to be part of making equality happen, to be part of the solution. Men need to be allies and partners and supporters uh, in uh, the fight for equality because it ends up uh, helping us all. And uh, the question about becoming PM, absolutely, I totally uh, support everything Jacinda said. And I think the path towards politics, uh, as you think about it, there's not one path that will lead you towards politics. You don't say, okay, I've got to you know, study in school and go into political science and then start working on a political campaign. And I mean, that's a path and some people do it. But anything that charges you up and gets you passionate and gets you connecting with people and bringing people together and creating actions and impacts in the world is a path towards political activity and eventually, possibly, politics if you still uh, want to do that. So be open to having a political impact as an active, engaged citizen, and you'll be amazed uh, with how far that brings you. And the last comment is about needing to have um, more women wanting to become prime minister, able to become prime minister, able to be successful in politics. I mean, one of the things that we were able to do in Canada was appoint a gender balanced cabinet, 50% uh, uh, men, 50% women uh, in, uh, in, our, in our government. But in order to do that, I had to spend a few years trying to convince uh, extraordinary women across Canada to step forward into politics. And you really notice when you're asking great people, and I ask great people all sorts of backgrounds to come uh, join me and, and step up into politics, when you ask a guy if he wants to go into politics, if he'll step forward in <coughs> politics, his first question is usually something like, uh, why did it take you so long to ask me? Uh, you know, there's, there's this, oh great, I'm good, I'm happy to do it. If you ask a woman uh, if she wants to come in, into politics, there's usually a pause, and it's exactly what, what, what Jacinda said, uh, is really, do you think I'm, I'm good enough? Do you think I have enough capacity? Do you think, and you, you meet these people with extraordinary CVs, extraordinary backgrounds, uh, but there is a, a system that keeps us doubting or keeps women doubting that they can succeed. And we really have to deliberately break down the barriers out there, but also the barriers in mindsets that happen. And having conversations like this are a big part of it. I can say before, before the next round, so, so uh, in, our, in our cabinet, there are actually very few women in, in the cabinet. When Justin became prime minister in 2015, the first cabinet he appointed had half who were women. And when Justin was asked the question, uh, what was your answer, Justin? Uh, well, I said, uh, I said, yeah, I said it was 2015. Uh, <laughs> why, why, why is it important to have half women, half men uh, in, uh, in, in, in government? And it was a ridiculous question, so I said, because it is. Because it's time that we stopped realizing that uh, 
parity is some far off thing we have to reach to. It's something we have to take concrete actions towards right now. And the best thing about the gender balance pa cabinet isn't the symbol, isn't uh, the, the indication that it can be done or should be done. It's actually the kind of conversations and the substance of the, the debates we have and the solutions we put <coughs> forward which are better because we have a more diverse uh, group of people making that decision. And that's, that's the fundamental thing. <laughs> okay. The next round we've got from Deptford Green School, Padrick. Can somebody get the mic to Padrick? So over here, front row, chap here. And the second question is going to be to Kelly Parra from St. Saviour's. Where's Kelly? In the back. Okay, Kelly's in the back. And the third one is from Jamie uh, McCarran Gamez from Heartlands High. Where's Jamie? Okay, you first, yeah. Over to you. Um, do you support uh, lowering the age at which I can vote to 16? Um, or why do you think it is uh, important? Okay, so currently it's 18 in, in the mm. UK. Um, so, so, Kelly? Um, how can we uh, help tackle gender inequality? Great question. Uh, and the third question is from Jamie. Uh, what does being a feminist mean to you? Great question. I'll ask Justin to go first and, and let Justin respond uh, second. So, Justin. Um, there, there, there's a, a long conversation in Canada about how we get more young people to vote because over the past years there was a real decline in young people taking an interest in politics and a lot of people said, oh, let's lower the voting age, we'll make voting mandatory like it is in some countries, there's different things we can do to get young people to vote and I took a slightly different perspective on it. I said, Instead of you know, trying to address the symptoms of the problems of young people not voting, um, let's try and address the root cause. Why are young people not voting or not stepping up into politics? Because I knew from the work that I'd been doing with young people that it wasn't because they didn't care about politics or because they were cynical or because they, they're, they're apathetic about the world. And if there was apathy and frustration, it was never because they don't care about the, you don't care about the world, it was very much about feeling that you're not given the tools to actually have an impact in the world you want to change and therefore there's frustration. So we really focused on bringing young people into the conversation, empowering them in politics, and not just as volunteers and envelope stu stuffers, but actually part of the conversation to talk about how we're going to improve our society for the long term, how we're going to take care of the big long-term issues uh, that young people are most focused on, whether it's you know, the future of technology or the environment or human rights or Canada and the world. These were all issues that mattered in a big way that young people wanted to talk about other than, rather than a specific change to a tax system that might or might not make a big impact in the world. So being bold enough to have big conversations brought young people in in a way that we turned around and increased youth voting uh, without having to lower the voting age. Although we do have a great program in Canada where high school students who aren't voting age yet have fully organized mock elections so they can get used to the idea of voting even though their votes don't count. They get into uh, the political process and start thinking about it in a way that leaves them ready to do it because when they turn 18. What about, what about your views on, on New Zealand? Is it 18 in New Zealand? It is, it is. And, and we have a turnout issue for um, our, our younger voters as well. But actually we've had a turnout issue for younger voters for a number of years. It's, it's not new. Um, but we do worry about it. We worry about it because it means that there's underrepresentation, that young people are not having their voice heard. And two things I would say on that. I agree with Justin that you know, one of the issues that, as I perceive it in New Zealand, is we have this skate, I call it skate park syndrome. <laughs> Go out and find out what young people feel about building skate parks in their local community because surely that's what young people care about. You know, I go into schools and um, it's one of my favourite things to do and talk about um, the issues that young people are interested in talking about, it is more often than not things like child poverty, inequality, um, climate change, the big issues that actually we're grappling with in government but actually probably not doing enough to talk about, not doing enough to demonstrate that we're taking the action that young people really want us to take. So why would a young person vote if they don't see anything from their representatives or their candidates that speak to the things they care about? So that's one thing, actually talking about those issues that really matter uh, is the first thing. And the second thing though is I think we would be wrong to assume that voting is the only way that people have power. Mm. 
Probably one of my biggest group of people who write to me would be children at primary school. I get bundles and bundles of letters from children. In fact, we had to bring in someone to help me, especially with the letters that I get from children, which I find wonderful because it means at the end of a long, usually out of, after I come from, we have this in New Zealand question time, it's very shouty. Um, and it's very robust, and so every time I'm in question time, I'll be answering a lot of questions from the opposition. Um, what are the th one of the things I do is I take down my folder of children's correspondence down to the debating chamber. So when I'm done with all the shouty questions, I look at pictures and drawings from children. And they're not just sending me happy smiley faces, they are most often sending me their worries in the world. Turtles and straws up turtles' noses. Plastic bags in the sea. They care deeply about issues that lots of people talk about. We'd be wrong to think children and young people don't. Now those letters have an impact on me. I'm talking about them now because I see them so often. There is power in petitions. There is power in letters. And all of those have no age barrier in my country. A 16 year old could take a petition to parliament and force parliament to consider it. You don't have to vote to have power. And so for me it's about ups making sure that you have knowledge about the tools that you have in our system to make change. And, and a question, um, both of you are Prime Ministers and you've got huge power, how do we fight gender inequality? I mean, big, big issue. Um, we sort of put a, a gender lens on just about everything we do and that is recognising that uh, the policy a government puts forward uh, has a different impact on men than it does on women. You also think about intersectionality and uh, a woman who is uh, from a visible minority or the LGBT community. Uh, you get layers of discrimination uh, that, that can add up and we have to be really sensitive to all the challenges that uh, hit people differently. And when you start thinking about the impact of everything you do as a government with a diversity lens, with a gender lens, uh, you suddenly come up with solutions uh, that aren't just you know, better or more popular, they're usually smarter. And that's one of the big points that we've made, that gender equality is not just a societal or moral issue, it's actually a cold hard economic issue. Giving uh, you know, a full half of the population full opportunities to contribute, to lead, to, to, to achieve their fullest potential is the only way a society in, in, as a whole can achieve its potential. So making sure uh, we're doing things that, yes, are within the traditional more uh, gender equality issues of, of, of domestic violence or, uh, or child care or issues like that, yes, that's important, but it's also thinking about just about everything else uh, with that gender lens. Construction projects in rural areas, if you're building a highway through a, a rural area, well, you have to think you're going to be sending a whole bunch of mostly men construction workers to uh, faraway towns and communities that's going to have an impact on that community around violence, around, uh, around gender issues. We also have to think about how uh, we make sure that through proactive pay legislation, uh, women uh, get paid uh, the same as men for similar jobs. Now, Canada's done a lot with the gender balanced uh, cabinet, with a, a, a gender budget that we put forward. Our, our entire national budget had a gender lens on it in 2018, just, uh, just a few months ago. But when you actually look at the numbers, we're way down in terms of women in parliament, we're way down in terms of women in boards, and we're actually uh, fairly low in terms of actual gender, gender parity in terms of the workplace. So we recognize that there's some things we're talking about really well, but there's other things uh, we're working on, but we still got a really long way to go. And that, that comment that Jacinda made about complacency and knowing that we have to challenge ourselves to do better and constantly think about it is is the only way we close the gaps around gender equality. Just yeah. that. And also yeah. this, the other question about what feminism means means to you as well. What feminism means to me? Who, who believes in equality? Who believes in equality? You are all feminists. Because that, for me, it is, that is at its most simple. That is what femini feminism is. It's just that simple idea of fairness. Now, lots of stereotypes hang off that word, lots of them. We were talking about them some of the, before, and all of you had such good insights into all of the stereotypes that hang off that one word. And that comes with a word that has so much history, waves of history, different movements at different times. But if you drill it all back down, and if you just simplify it, 
Feminism is about fairness and equality. Now, that means that actually the work that we have to do sits across a whole lot of areas. Now, one of the things I sometimes get frustrated by is this idea that the only markers we have are women's representation. We've, we've had almost 40% women in our New Zealand Parliament. It's the highest we've had ever. Um, we right now have a female Governor General. Uh, I'm a female, obviously, Prime Minister. A female Chief Justice. Does it mean our work is done? No, because again, as I say, the measures that matter a lot to me are about the ones in everyday life uh, and the experience that women have in the workplace in everyday life. Uh, and that isn't just up to politicians, that's up to all of us. So that's also why feminism for me is about everybody. It's about men, it's about women, um, it's about making sure that everyone, no matter where, which workplace they're in, which school they're in, actually just gets a fair go and we just try and weed out some of those, um, some of those uh, very old-fashioned behaviours. Okay, we're going to move on to the next round of questions. Uh, we've got Zariel, uh, Adiola and Cathy Ann. Where's Zariel? From Heartlands. Um, Hi, um, I would like to know uh, what does equality mean to you and how can it be represented in society? Sorry, say, say that again. What is equality to mean to equality. you and what, how can it be represented in society? Great. And uh, Adiola? Hi. Um, I also want to say congratulations on your pregnancy. Thanks very much. And um, my question is, how do you deal with prejudice against women in politics? Good. That, that's, that's for you, clearly. Yes. Uh, uh, Katyan from Deptford Green. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, what should be done about the gender pay gap and what are you doing about it? Great, great, great questions. Great. Yeah, I'll start. And on the gender pay gap, we're actually, at the moment, we have legislation that we're working on to make sure that actually we give a mechanism for people to close, close the gender, um, to make sure that we can address some of our pay equity issues. So. Um, we're doing it through a couple of ways, but the law is, is one of them. But I'll, I'll leave Justin perhaps to pick up a bit more on, on um, that one as well. Uh, we actually just not long had a landmark court case uh, where home, home care workers, people who looked after the elderly, um, we went through a process and, and really challenged the idea that they were being paid fairly and the court found in their favour and it's meant a massive difference in pay increase for those predominantly women who work as home care workers. So that's the kind of um, work we're trying to do, but without you having to go through the courts to achieve it. On um, the uh, issues, uh, inequality or issues if I face in politics, do you know, I'm lucky. I'm the third female prime minister in my country. The third. Um, that's really remarkable when you think about uh, some of our other um, other countries and, and some who are just having their first. We're on our third. And I have to say that those women really paved a way for me. They've made a huge difference uh, in the kind of experience that I'm now having in leadership. Having said that, probably I had just as many difficult moments when I was outside of politics as I do in. I still remember in one of my really early jobs, um, my first boss, um, who was a woman, um, told me I would never get promoted unless I cut my hair. I haven't cut my hair since. I have to say, I'm like Samson now. I've had this almost Can I say, Justin had the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> because she thought I didn't look serious and that no one would ever take me seriously as a woman if I had long hair. I know that's a really trivial little example, but I just use it to say that actually, yes, in politics, um, I do experience um, bits of it here and there. Um, but I have a lot of people who come in and defend when it happens. When I was in that workplace, there was no one else but me to take it on by myself. And that was probably harder in a lot of ways. And so that's why I'm really conscious that even if we look like we're weeding it out in the high places, we've got to think about the other workplaces too. And we've got to look out for one another in those workplaces. Um, and so perhaps then um, my experience isn't, isn't quite as bad as, as others I've seen. The one final thing I'll say is, that when I was elected to be the leader of the Labour Party in New Zealand, um, I was the youngest member of that caucus and I was a woman. And all the MPs in my team backed me. So having a great team around you really makes a difference too. Cracking answer. Just, yeah. Justin. Um, on the gender pay gap, I think it's important as well that we, we recognise what the gender pay gap is. 
Uh, it's not, you know, if you go to a bank and there's two bank tellers in front of you, uh, and you know, one's a man, one's a woman, that they might make uh, a different salary. Although if, if they're not making the same salary, uh, there's a problem there for the same seniority, same years of experience, same job. It's in different types of jobs. Mm. I mean, Jacinda talked about home care workers mm. uh, that are more predominantly women, uh, but that might be the same amount of training, the same kind of challenging job as uh, a job in uh, being a, a building engineer or a, a, you know, a, a, a more uh, custodial services or something that is more male dominated. So it's looking at different types of jobs uh, and seeing, well, if this one is more of a, a, a women-dominated job and that one's more of a male-dominated job and they have about the same degree of difficulty, and that's sort of the challenge or degree of, of, of quality or value, um, making sure that what happens right now is that the women's jobs are usually underpaid, that you raise the salaries of those women's jobs so that uh, it's fair across the board. And that's a fairly complicated uh, thing to do within society. We're doing it within our public service. We're also putting forward legislation that we're working on. We should compare notes on, on how we're doing it. But it's something actually that comes a little more easy because larger companies are now much more uh, computer you know, savvy and the HR departments are all plugged in in terms of salaries. You can actually have more transparency on who's getting paid what and constantly check. And it's Pay equity is not about just bringing in a law and saying, okay, you have to adjust everything. It's about iterating and checking in every few years to make sure that, that you're doing better every time. It's not an end, it's a process. And doing that is going to be really, really important. Um, around women in politics and prejudice, we're going through, uh, in politics, in Canada and around the world, uh, the same kinds of things that are happening in uh, Hollywood, in uh, the banking industry, in you know, so many different industries, which is the Me Too movement. Uh, a, a, a sense of time's up, that harassment in the workplace uh, is unacceptable in any place, in any way. And starting with a position of support and belief for anyone who comes forward with a story of harassment seems like a simple thing, but it's really, really important. Uh, when uh, usually a woman uh, comes forward with a story of being uh, harassed, or intimidated, or, or sexually assaulted, or harassed at work, um, these we have to, as a society, do a much better job of believing and supporting and moving forward with them in that. There's still a huge amount of stigma and challenge, and we have to bring that more into the open and deal with it through uh, processes that are actually supportive and fair. Uh, and the old boys club and the idea that, oh, we're going to you know, brush it under the rug, that we have to stop. And we've done uh, significant strides in Parliament, but there are huge challenges because harassment and sexual assault is usually, if not always, about power dynamics as well. And politics is a hugely uh, hierarchical structure with massive power dynamics and young volunteers and, and people who are you know, in danger of losing their job for random reasons. There's a huge amount of work we all have to do, but it starts with all of, it all of us standing up clearly and strongly together and saying, this behavior is unacceptable uh, and uh, it's going to stop. And that's uh, what we need your generation to understand and be part of pushing the change because you know, some older generations still don't get it. Okay, so I've got somebody at the back telling me, so I think which means time, which must mean time is right up. Across or the tower of London, she wants to hear yeah, quiet. shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> so can I, can I say a couple of things? First, I want Jacinda and Justine to have just 30 seconds each just to wind up uh, and say the final words, because they, they've both got really incredibly busy diaries. There are 53 separate heads of government here in London. They've got meetings with some of them. They've got meetings with the royal family, with the prime minister, members of the cabinet. And they've made time to come and listen to and speak to young Londoners. So before I ask Jacinda and Justine to say a few words, can I ask us to show our London appreciation to the Prime Minister of New Zealand and the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin and Jacinda. <laughs> now before, before Jacinda goes first, just, you know, when they finish, we're, we're going to jump down. Hopefully, all of us are going to jump down. 
uh, and have a photograph. I'm going to take the stairs. Yeah. Yeah. Walk carefully and down the stairs. We'll, yes. we'll, we'll take a team photograph, which we'll send, we'll send to you and stuff. So just send over to you. Oh, I'm going I'm to be really quick. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for caring. Thank you for caring about issues that are really important no matter where you live in the world. And I actually say the same thing that Justin says quite often. I get frustrated by this leaders of tomorrow issue. Um, no one knows what it is to be a 15, 16, 17 year old in 2018 living in London, but you do. Your experience is unique. Your views therefore are important. Um, so never let anyone tell you that they're not. Um, I first joined a political movement at 17 um, because I wanted to change the world. I started by delivering leaflets. You can start with anything and you'll never know where that journey will take you. So don't let anyone diminish the importance um, of your opinions. And finally, you live in an amazing city. I loved living in London. I lived in Brixton um, and Vauxhall when I last lived in um, London. I loved being here. Um, you have a lot to be proud of in your city. Um, it's um, diversity is one of them, but your is pretty cool as well. So Thank thanks you. for having us. <laughs> Justin. Um, my message, very similar to Jacinda's, you matter. What you do matters. And uh, equality, obviously, is something that, that matters to all of us. The idea of fairness is something that's, that's ingrained in humans. You know, we want the world to be fair, even though in so many ways it's not. In the ways that we can make it fairer, your words matter. Your actions matter. If you see someone uh, making fun or bullying against someone, step up, step in. If you have a capacity to change the way people think, to challenge the world around you, and to gather people with you to continue that challenge, to do the right thing, be brave, be bold. Look for ways to have that impact to shape the world around. The world will be what you all make it. And you have to understand that you do have the power to shape the world. And ultimately, you know, as has been said many times, you will not define your own success and your happiness by what you get from the world, but how you shape the world around you, how you have an impact on the world, how you bring meaning and relevance to your life through how you impact and shape your community. So know that the choices you make are actually not just shaping your lives, but the whole world you're part of. And uh, you know, the opportunity for us to see and hear and be inspired as we go off to speak with a whole bunch of different heads of government, to be connected to all of you is the best possible way I could start uh, this day and any day. Thank you for continuing to inspire me and reassuring me that our future and our present is in very good hands. Justin Jacinda, thank you very much.